Hello everyone, please meet Gary Kaufman, a prominent North Carolina biologist and an SHC member since 1988. Gary has worked with the U.S. Forest Service since 2002 on the Nantahala and Pisgah National Forest. He is currently the botanist for all North Carolina National Forests, including the Uari and Croatan. We invited Gary to Little Rock Creek, 109 acres which we protected just this year, to help you ID some of the most common plants found in the highlands of Rhone. Hi everyone, uh, this right here is a uh, deceptive plant. This is a uh, dame's rocket, which is actually a member of the mustard family. A lot of people think it's fox, but if you really look at the individual petals, there's four of them, not five. Phlox has five. Dame's rocket has four. Pick away the, uh, the individual uh, petals. You'll see that there's stamens, the male portion, that a couple uh, above and some below. So that will tell you it's in the Crisiphi family, which is the mustard family. And many members of the mustard family are very, um, have a mustardy taste to them. <laughs> so sometimes you can eat them. You know, but use caution. Never listen to a botanist. Okay, what we're uh, looking at here is a plant that everybody should know. And you see that there's three leaflets on this vine. See how it's vining up the stem? And a lot of times you'll see it on the ground too. This is poison ivy. This is, has the, um, is Toxidodendron radicans. And it has uh, the urticol that can cause irritation and bumps on people that are allergic to it. So it's very, very important to understand this plant. Then as it's vining up, you'll see hairs along the stem of uh, the individual um, vine. So it's best not to touch it or to get near it. What we have here uh, in this rock, and usually in a stream, is a branch lettuce. It's a uh, member of the uh, saxifrage family. And uh, it's called lettuce for because some people actually eat it. Typically, um, you're looking for habitat, you wanna look at, it's usually in a live stream. It has uh, big teeth. It's usually very elongated leaves and uh, kind of small little uh, white greenish flowers at the top of the, um, mostly a basil rosette, a rosette that stays uh, uh, attached to the ground. So that's an attractive uh, little plant. Hey again, uh, this uh, particular species here is uh, Plantago plantain. Uh, there's a lot of different species. Some are native, some are non-native. Um, um, as you can see here, where they, where they occur is uh, they can occur in your yard, um, in the grass where you mow it. They can, uh, we're in a kind of a, an old field. They occur here. A lot of times they occur roadside edge. But the cool thing about um, IDing it is, you see these, uh, this is parts of the vascular traces that um, move water up to the leaf tissue. But when you pull apart the petiole, they, kind of, they uh, um, remain. That's one good way to tell it. But what's cool about plantain is, is that you can chew it up. Don't do this at home, folks. And if you get a bee sting, which you often get um, around fields or in your yard, you can uh, apply that to your sting and it'll take, pull out some of the poison out. It works really well. It's kind of similar to uh, chewing tobacco and putting it on a, uh, um, a little sting. So that is a, a useful application for a plant that you can find in many locations. Here we have a, a, a species, a nice lily. This is probably Lilium superbum, a uh, Turk's cap lily. You can see the whorls of leaves on each of the nodes where you have from um, five to nine uh, leaves. It's probably a Turk's cap versus gray's lily, a rarer species, because uh, um, very narrow leaflets. We're gonna collect a little bit and make sure, but we're also a very low elevation for uh, gray's lily. And there's a bunch 
uh, of uh, the Turk's Cap right here in this area. But uh, what is interesting about um, this area is the uh, Turk's Cap is also getting the lily leaf spot, uh, just like the Gray's Lily. So it is being impacted. And one thing that, that also makes it difficult for uh, Turk's Cap lily is it can hybridize with other species and uh, make it uh, a little more difficult to uh, ID when it is in uh, leaf instead of blooming. It should be blooming in uh, perhaps uh, two, two to three weeks. So there you have it. Okay, what we have here is uh, another plant that um, there's two little stems here. I have one that I uh, broke off. Uh, to ID this, you want to look at one, it has opposite leaves along the stem. And if you look at the stem, it's actually square. This particular one, this particular species, is, has really hairy stems. This is probably, um, this is a mountain mint. Uh, another way to um, ID mountain mint is to actually take the leaves, crush them, and smell them. It has a very strong odor or fragrance. Smells a little bit like penny roll. Now this particular species is probably a Pycnanthum montanum. It's best to um, eye these when they're actually blooming. But um, the, um, the individual species uh, aren't necessarily used for, as a food, but maybe as a, as a tea, a very strong uh, penny royal-like tea. Okay, here we have a beautiful little garden display, so to speak. Um, of a little succulent. People don't think of succulents so much in the woods. We're in a forested habitat here, totally forested, covered canopy, in a rich cove forest. But one species that you do find there is this little sedum. This is sedum ternatum. This particular species has the really thick succulent-like leaves, like uh, cac members of the uh, cactus family and other sedums. And, um, is interesting in that uh, the species is much more abundant east of Asheville and very uh, um, unabundant west of Asheville. I don't know, quite know why, but the, the Asheville Basin seems a, as a barrier. This particular species will bloom white early in the springtime, has white starry little flowers, quite attractive. And right behind it is another species that you may not always recognize but you feel when you put your hands around it this what some people call stinging nettle but is actually wood nettle only because it has an alternate leaf pattern but it has these stinging hairs on it which has urtic acid in it that urtic acid is what causes the ir irritation on your leaf on your hands and, um, but what is interesting about this species is it's loaded with iron. If you collect this early in the season, dunk it in some boiling water for like a minute, then you can eat it as a green. It tastes somewhat similar to asparagus, quite delicious, and gets rid of all the uh, stinging hairs. Trust me. But again, never trust the botanist. Okay, here we have an interesting fern. You can see it has the fern-like foliage, but look at all the leaves. If you look at the triangular shape, all the, le the leaflets are penny. If you go like this, square here, it has a long point here, and they all come from one single point along the main stem. And then you have a long extended um, stem with the spores uh, with the um, reproductive portion of the fern and this particular species is rattlesnake fern or um, what used to be Botrychium virginianum but the name has been changed to protect the innocent it's now Botrypus virginianus okay what we have here is one of the uh, signature shrubs of the high elevation particularly um, and Roan Mountain in general. But this is the Catawba rhododendron, Rhododendron catawbiense. What you can see with this particular rhododendron is 
you look at the individual leaf, you see the base of it is rounded. And the underside is, um, is somewhat whitish. In comparison, the really abundant rhododendron that has the white flowers that you often see along streams, those particular leaves, they're tapered at the base of the leaf and they're not whitish on the underside. And uh, they, they occur at all low elevation. Whereas this one is more indicative of uh, heath balds and uh, is very, very popular at Rome Mountain for the Rhododendron Festival. Okay, here's another plant. Uh, this is often associated with uh, wetlands or wet meadows. This is a green-headed coneflower, Rubecchia laciniata. Rubecchia is related to other um, black-eyed Susans. But this particular species will get up to um, six feet in height and be um, <clears throat> will have a blossom at the top of the stem with the yellow ray flowers and the green uh, cone, cones. That's why it's called green-headed cone flower. The, um, but the individual leaves have these five lobes, three lobes here and two at the base. Oftentimes it, it uh, is somewhat uh, glaucous. You can see how you can uh, rub this white uh, um, appearance off the stem. So again, this uh, usually blooms uh, mid-summer, mid to late summer. And it's also uh, an interesting plant because the Native Americans, the Cherokee, um, relished this as a uh, edible early in the springtime. And I'm probably mispronouncing their, their term for it. Uh, it's Sochan. Uh, really wonderful tree species, uh, very diverse. Critigus, um, species hawthorns so, or sometimes they're called haws they uh, often have thorns you can see these uh, really wonderful thorns here uh, very divided thorns and then the leaves can be variable in shape often um, kind of uh, rounded uh, toothed mostly tooth lobed but there there's a great diversity of species of uh, hawthorns. This might be a Washington hawthorn. I'm not sure. I would have to look it up. And just to be truthful, um, I tend to suffer from critigiitis, which is fear of naming critigus. Um, but there's probably, um, here in the southern Appalachians, 30 to 40 different species, maybe more. Um, and um, they can be quite variable also. But they provide great edge habitat. They can be in uh, old fields on the edge of a woods, provide lots of habitat for uh, birds and other uh, wildlife species. And they, um, and the, um, they have uh, these very nutritious uh, berries that uh, a lot of uh, bird species uh, really relish. We're gonna look at uh, a fern here right now. Uh, there's a, a fair number of ferns that occur here in the Southern Appalachian. This is a, uh, a fairly common one, but uh, somewhat what I call the aristocrat, the lady fern, uh, Ethereum and Gustafolium. Now this one has a purple rachis or stem. However, uh, be very, very careful. You, you do not always get that purple color. So sometimes color can be deceptive when you're looking for things. What you it looks like a fern. It has the uh, foliage, um, ferny foliage, but it's not real heavily dissected. But the individual, this is one whole leaf or frond, and a uh, pinnule and the pinnae, if you look at them along the, the stem there, they're alternating. And then what you really want to do uh, to um, kind of distinguish this from, uh, particularly when it's young, from some of the wood ferns is to look at the, uh, take a cross section of the stem and look at that. And if you use your hand lens and you look, there's actually two vascular terraces. There's not three to five. Two of them will, will put you in the um, lady fern. If it's three to five, it's some of the uh, dryopteris species or the wood ferns. 
Questions? Here is one of the amazing vines in the eastern U.S. This particular species is um, sometimes called smoke vine, um, sometimes called Dutchman's pipe. Previously was known as Aristolochia macrophylla. Now the name has been changed to Isotrema macrophylla. Macrophylla, uh, it has big heart-shaped leaves, but it has, it's a huge vine. Look at that. It can get quite large where you can actually climb the, the uh, tree on up. But what's really cool, it's related to wild ginger, same family. Look at that flower. It looks like a Mirashim pipe. Where's Sherlock Holmes? Is he some, around here? Where's the uh, smoking mix? Um, but this, this actually um, flower attracts ants like uh, um, for, um, for pollination and things like that. So it's a very uh, specialized uh, species and very interesting species here in the Southern Appalachian and across the Eastern U.S.